It's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'll start with a disclaimer. I am not a historian. Historians spend their entire professional career in the field of history. My professional career has been spent in the field of applied numerical electromagnetics. In the 25 years I've spent in this field, I started wondering just who is this Maxwell fellow anyway. <coughs> Historians consider him to be the equal of Newton and Einstein. You can find biographies on Newton and Einstein everywhere. Where are the biographies on Maxwell? Well, I started taking day trips as a tourist into the field of history and in search of Maxwell biographies. And uh, I would find uh, bright, shiny pebbles and bring them home. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is share some of those bright, shiny pebbles with you. Uh, first, a note on pronunciation. James Clark Maxwell is the correct pronunciation, and I correctly pronounced it. Uh, the American <coughs> English pronunciation would be Clark, but the correct British pronunciation is Clark. And Clark is not his middle name. We'll solve that mystery here in a moment. I like to do quotes in different voices so you know what's quoted and what's not. My first quote is from one of these four American scientists. See if you can guess which one said. The most significant event of the 19th century will be judged Maxwell's discovery of the laws of electrodynamics. The American Civil War will pale into provincial insignificance in comparison with this most important scientific event of the same decade. The person who said that, of course, is Richard Feynman. If you've never read any of Richard Feynman's book, I suggest you run, don't walk, to the nearest bookstore after this presentation and pick up some of his books. One is, for example, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Very readable, fantastic, uh, how he, the genius of simplicity. He can make the most complicated things seem so incredibly simple. Why didn't I think of that? Feynman got a Nobel Prize for quantum electrodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics works where Maxwell's equations fail. Maxwell's equations fail for low power when you can count individual photons. And there in the background, we see Feynman diagrams illustrating photon-electron interactions for quantum electrodynamics. Josiah Willard Gibbs, you know the Gibbs phenomena? He is the father, little known, oh, he's, he's, he's a father of modern thermodynamics, but also little known, he formalized vector calculus, div and curl, after Maxwell's death. Think about that for a little bit. John von Neumann is kind of my connection to Maxwell through computer architecture. He also did a lot with uh, quantum theory. Barbara McIntosh uh, worked with DNA. No connection with Maxwell that I know of. However, uh, it's kind of neat because both she and I are Cornell graduates. I'll talk a little bit about his ancestry, birth, and youth. Edinburgh Academy is where he took high school. University of Edinburgh and Cambridge is where he took college. Became a professor at Marshall College in Aberdeen. He was terminated from that position. I'll explain why. He had trouble getting another position. I'll explain why on that as well. He did finally get a position at King's <coughs> College in London, and he retired from that, came back, and became the founding director of Cavendish Laboratory. We'll talk about his illness and death, a little bit about his contribution in electromagnetics. He contributed to many, many areas. I'll be very brief on that. There are no equations in this entire uh, uh, presentation except on this one stamp right here. The D dot is the DE by DT displacement current term. When Maxwell figured that out, put it into Maxwell's equation, out pops a traveling wave with a speed of light. Light is electromagnetic radiation. There are only three stamps in the entire world devoted to Maxwell. And uh, all three will be in this presentation. His ancestry will start back in the year 1568. Mary, Queen of Scots, <coughs> Catholic queen of a Protestant country, found her life in mortal danger. She fled for safety against all advice to her closest blood relative, Queen Elizabeth I. Queen Elizabeth I immediately threw her in prison. The Clarks of Aberdeen likewise found themselves in danger, and they fled for safety to the south, south of Edinburgh, here in Pennacook, became the Clarks of Pennacook. These maps are from the 1892 Encyclopedia Britannica, in which Maxwell has a number of articles. I'll show you one later in the presentation. In the meantime, after almost 20 years of imprisonment, Mary, Queen of Scots, was executed. It did not go well, requiring three strokes. Hours before her execution, she gave these jewels to her maid. These jewels are on display today in the National Museum of Scotland. They're called the Pennacook Jewels. They came from the Clarks of Pennacook, direct Maxwell ancestors. In his ancestry, we'll go over the circled red ones in a little more detail. John Clark, the first baronet. Sir John, the second baronet. John Clark of Eldon, that's a great, great uncle of Maxwell. We'll come down here. 
James Clark Maxwell, that's his grandfather, same name. John Clark is his father, and there is James Clark Maxwell, that's our guy. Also his cousin, his father's sister's daughter, uh, Jemima Wedderburn, uh, Maxwell's cousin. We'll call her Cousin Jemima. Uh, you're probably wondering, I promised you a presentation on Maxwell, and I'm talking about the Clarks. What's going on here? This is a truly bizarre story. Listen carefully. Sir John Clark, the first baronet, had a brother, William. William married one Agnes Maxwell. Agnes was the sole heiress to a very large estate in uh, extreme southeastern Scotland. It was a result of a feud between the Maxwells and I believe the Johnsons. She was the sole survivor. In order to inherit the estate, uh, uh, they wanted the estate in the, uh, in the Clark family line. So they, uh, uh, Sir John Clark arranged a marriage between William and Agnes. And in order to inherit the estate, William took on his wife's last name. He became William Clark Maxwell. Bill doesn't explain how George got the Maxwell name here. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about George. He could do some things well, some things not so well. He could spend money very well. Earning money was another problem. He had um, uh, quite a lifestyle. And in order to keep the estate, the Maxwell estate, in the Clark family, Sir John Clark uh, arranged a mar another marriage between uh, George Clark and William and Agnes's daughter, Dorothea. So it's a little bit of a tight loop on the family tree here, but th those things happened back then. Uh, so he inherits the estate, takes on the Maxwell name, and you can follow the estate down through the family tree. Brothers and sisters are Clark, and they add the Maxwell name to those who inherit the estate, including our James Clark Maxwell. This Clark is not his middle name. It's really Clark Maxwell is his last name. Today we might hyphenate it. Uh, going back to the top of the family tree, Sir John Clark, the first baronet, was a member of Scottish Parliament. This was the final Scottish Parliament until modern times. Uh, he helped oversee the unification of the Scottish Parliament with the English Parliament to make the British Parliament, the United Kingdom. He also, they loved to tell stories around the Maxwell fireplace in the evening. One of the stories they liked to tell is how he fought off 16 robbers in 1692 when he returned home. Must have been quite a story. Uh, Sir John Clark, the second baronet, was a lawyer. In fact, most of the Clarks were lawyers, and Maxwell himself was destined to become a lawyer until he decided that it was some other kind of laws, the laws of nature, that he was really intended to study. An excellent musician. It was considered improper, very he's upper class, very class conscious. There's certain things you can do, certain things you can't do. And upper class, you don't perform music in public. But he was also a composer. And he, uh, one of the finest composers Scotland ever produced, and an antiquarian. He wrote a six-volume history of Britain entirely in Latin. He took part of his education at the University of Leiden, and his father found out that uh, his son was getting interested in this subject called mathematics. Today, mathematics is the key to power if you want to be successful in uh, engineering or technology or science. Back then, it was like we do video games today. Hey, kid, why are you scribbling all that stuff on a piece of paper? Why don't you do something useful? And he wrote to, uh, John Clark wrote to his son some very important advice. The Italians call a fool a little mathematician. I hope you are not so great a fool as to aim at becoming a famous one. Fortunately, our James Clark Maxwell did not follow his ancestor's advice. John Clark Eldon, a great, great uncle off to the right side of the family tree. Uh, was an excellent artist. He also owned coal mines. In the coal mines, he wondered why the rock was layered. And so did his buddy, James Hutton. And they would go around the Scottish countryside, they'd find rock outcroppings, and John Clark would sketch them, and James Hutton would try to figure out, uh, suppose, uh, the scenarios of how the rock got that way. And they wrote a book, illustrated by John Clark Eldon, Eldon Theory of the Earth, the founding document for modern geology. He was also an expert on naval combat, in spite of the fact of never having sailed a ship in his entire life. You see ships in the background, and he's holding a naval chart. Uh, he tested out his naval combat theories by sailing small ships, small model ships, on a pond. And this is the day of sailing. Uh, the, the way naval battles were fought back then is you'd have uh, the ships of opposing navies would form, each form a line, and they kind of edge closer together under the influence of the wind, whatever the wind is doing, it could be very important. They edge closer together, and when they got within cannon range, they start shooting and try to blast each other out of the water. 
Uh, John Clark of Eldon suggested, well, let's take our ships, form them into two groups, and we will come in at right angles to the uh, opposing Navy. While we're coming in, we take a blistering because they can shoot at us, but we can't shoot at them. But as you break the line, you can shoot at the sterns of their ships, which are very lightly defended. The sides are quite thick because they know there's cannonballs coming, but they aren't expecting anything on the stern. So just you blow these ships out of the water. Uh, the, uh, this battle, this strategy was used in only three naval battles. The Battle of the Chesapeake, Battle of the Nile, and the greatest and final sailing ship battle of all time, Battle of Trafalgar. The British Navy, the inferior sized British Navy under Lord Nelson is arrayed against the combined French and Spanish fleet and, uh, at uh, Trafalgar. And the British uh, fleet successfully wipes out almost the entire French and Spanish fleet establishing dominance for the British fleet over uh, the entire next century. Admiral Nelson did not survive the battle. He was picked off by a French sniper. Uh, his ship, the HMS Victory, is on display today at Portsmouth. There's a little plaque on the floor where uh, Admiral Nelson fell. And um, you want to see what Nelson looked like, go to the exact geographic center of London. There's a 100-foot tower, Trafalgar Square. Uh, grandfather, uh, you won't find uh, this story, by the way, in any history books. This, this story comes from the 1882 biography of Mantle by James Campbell. And this biography, uh, Campbell knew Mantle personally. And uh, this I found this biography when I was looking for things on Mantle. I found this biography, uh, scanned it, OCR'd it, put it on the web. You can download this from our website, sonnetsoftware.com. The entire biography is available there if you want it. Uh, grandfather of Maxwell, James, of the same name, James Clark Maxwell, was an East India Navy captain. Uh, he was shipwrecked once in the Hoogly in the river north of Calcutta. And in those days, most sailors did not know how to swim. You either drowned or you grabbed on something that floated. So Maxwell's grandfather grabbed on the bagpipes, blew them up, floated into shore, and as he got into shore, he, as they described it, played in an unco fit, i.e., very loudly. His intent was twofold, to act as a homing beacon for the other shipwrecked sailors, and second, to uh, keep the hungry tigers in the jungle at bay. He was successful, fortunately, because Maxwell's uh, son is our Maxwell's father. Cousin Jemima, off in the right-hand corner of the plot, really, really lucky to have this lady involved with Maxwell. She was a world-class photographer, and this is before the age of photography. I like to read people, you know, from these pictures. This, this is actually a picture. Her husband actually had quite a bit to do with the introduction of photography. But um, I like to read these pictures. Uh, you know, if you're playing poker, you try to read the person sitting next to you. Does he have a full house, or is he, is he bluffing? Let's read Jemima here. Ignore the dress, ignore the hairstyle, because those things change week to week, day to day. Facial expressions, however, are timeless. Read her facial expression. What I read is somebody who sees everything. You do not bluff this lady. And in fact, she has a photographic memory. She loved birds. She did not shoot them, stuff them, and pose them before painting. She sat by the nest, and when she saw a pose that she wanted to paint, she uh, instantly memorized every single detail and painted it absolutely accurately. You can even see a personality on this bird. Uh, we have a number of paintings of Maxwell by Jemima in his youth. I'll show you a few of them. Uh, condition of inheritance uh, for the estate. Uh, Maxwell's father, is he changes his last name to Maxwell, which he does, becomes John Clark Maxwell. And then uh, he lives, actually lives in Edinburgh. There is no manor house on the estate. So he lives in Edinburgh with his mother until her death in 1824 and at 14 India Street. Two years later, he marries Frances Kay. Here's Frances on the right. Her sister, Miss Jane, on the left, who never married. I'll refer to her as Miss Jane Kay, or to help you remember, his mother's cute little sister. Let's read, let's read Frances. Read Frances. Again, ignore the hair, ignore the hair, ignore the dress, but read the facial expression. What I read is somebody who is thoughtful, strong, intelligent, protective. Many of the same adjectives, and similar, not quite the same, for Miss Jane Kay. She became pregnant and gave birth to Elizabeth, who did not survive. And then on the 13th of June, 1831, she gave birth to our James Clark Maxwell. This is mother and child. Uh, Matt, young Maxwell is about three years old. Uh, look at uh, Frances. You see many of the same adjectives now. Uh, she is about uh, 36 years old and uh, a little more mature now. 
And uh, young James, we don't we don't see can't see too much here. Can't see too much detail in the eyes, and we get a clue from looking at the hands. Uh, any mother will tell you there's two kinds of children. There's children who want to cling to mommy, and there's children who want to be someplace else. Maxwell is clearly someone who wants to be someplace else and does not have the patience to sit down for uh, a long painting, so uh, it's difficult to capture any detail. This is the earliest known sketch of Maxwell. Uh, uh, both of these pictures were done by uncles who were also world-class paintings. Uh, this sketch uh, shows Maxwell about two years old. Look at those eyes. Any mother will tell you this kid is going to be a handful. There is fire in those eyes. Look at, he's holding on an owl. Look at the eyes of the owl. That owl is terrified. At first I thought this owl was, uh, was maybe a stuffed owl, but then I read that Jem Jemima had two live owls as pets. So I think that's actually a live owl. Maxwell did go through uh, life with his thumb, so yeah, the owl did not eat his thumb. That owl, that owl is terrifying. And look at the, uh, under his foot, he's got a, a frog trap and there's a salamander here on the other side. So, they're living in Edinburgh and they decide it's the time to build a manor house in uh, Kirkcudbrightshire, about two days by horse and carriage from uh, Edinburgh. On the river, or W means or water, or the river or we follow it up, and right there is where Glenlair is going to be, or the Castle Douglas just off, uh, just west of Dumfries. Uh, uh, my wife, my son, and I went to Edinburgh, went to Scotland uh, several years ago. We went by train one hour to Edinburgh, and then one hour to I mean to Lockerbie, and then one hour from, by car from Lockerbie to Glenlair. Uh, talk about uh, small world. In 1988, the owner of Glenlair, actually his wife Henrietta, spent her entire Christmas holiday preparing meals for the first responders to the Pan Am 103 flight disaster, which 288 people lost their lives because of a terrorist bomb, took out a 747, including 25 Syracuse University students. I had just finished two years as a visiting professor at Syracuse when this happened. Small world, if you're ever through there, be sure and stop by. T very touching memorials. Okay, so they're deciding to build a house on their estate in uh, Glenlair, and uh, this sketch is taken from that 1882 biography by Lewis Campbell. The sketch is itself taken from a Jemima watercolor. I don't have the watercolor, but the uh, sketch is, should, should be quite accurate. We see John Clark here, Maxwell's father. The women folk are picking stones, and they are picking stones for the purpose. I've done this. I grew up on a farm. It is hard, sweaty, dirty work. You do this in order to make the soil easier to till. Why does, does John Clark mean? Why does he have the women folk picking the stones? Well, we see a clue here. The men folk are up here in the corner. Looks like they're digging a hole in the ground. Glen Lair it has a very deep basement, and I think they're digging the basement to the house. So John Clark actually has the men folk. If you've ever dug a hole in stony, clayey soil, that is even harder work than um, than picking stones. So the women folk are actually doing the easier of the two jobs here. This is Glen Lair, a photo made by Maxwell himself a few years before his death. This field here is still farm. There's still cattle in it. If there's a bull, be careful. Don't go out in the field. And uh, this is the house that uh, Maxwell built. Maxwell had most of this uh, main foyer added. This was our original house here. This is the house today in 1929. There was a fire. The fire trucks came, but they had no water. All they could do was take uh, furniture out of the house. Uh, the, the, this is the house actually about five years ago. Notice we uh, actually, yes, this is about five years ago. We still have a roof on the, uh, this little foyer that Maxwell added. Uh, the roof here is gone. The roof is still there. We now have, about two years ago, grass growing. Uh, the roof on this little foyer is gone. Uh, the roof on the main section is still there, fortunately. Part of the problem are these crow-like birds that are slowly tearing the house to pieces, piece by piece, in addition to the rain, the wind, the snow, and the ice. If you, uh, this foyer, if you walk in this foyer, as Maxwell often, uh, certainly, well, certainly often did, turn to the right, look down, pull back the tarp off the floor. You see this beautiful tile floor composed of squares and triangles. We have white, red, green, and blue. Red, green, and blue. Why did Maxwell pick those colors? We'll return to this in a moment. This is the first view you have of Glen Lair as you come down the narrow access road. This is a disgrace. One of the three greatest physicists of all time. They deserve better than this. Uh, we have just arranged uh, funding in conjunction with the MTT Society to preserve. We won't be able to restore. That's beyond you know, reasonable expectation at this point. 
but we will be able to preserve what's left. This is kind of a holy electromagnetic religious site that we can make pilgrimages to. And believe me, after working with Maxwell's equations for 25 years, this is a very emotional site to visit. This is where Maxwell wrote the treatise on electricity and magnetism, founding document for our field. Uh, Maxwell was always very curious, saying things like, show me how it does, and if you didn't give an adequate answer, he'd become quite emphatic, very frustrating at times, as a matter of fact. Here we have another sketch of a Jemima watercolor, 1837. So Maxwell is six years old, plus or minus. And we look, let's see if we can find him. Two young adults, 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 uh, violin, or the dancer, violin player. There's Maxwell. He's, notice he's looking at the violin. He is not looking at the dancer. He's trying to figure out how the violin works. And although Jemima did not realize it when she did the original painting, this is foreshadowing. How does a violin work? You draw the bow across the string, the string vibrates transversely, side to side. That vibrates the sound box, the sound box then vibrates the air, and you hear the air. The air is vibrating longitudinally, it's pressure waves going back and forth. You can't vibrate air side to side because air has no shear strength. You can't vibrate a transverse wave in a medium that has no shear strength. We'll return to this topic in a moment as well. Maxwell, we think of as being primarily experimental. Actually, he did a huge amount, uh, primarily theoretical, he actually did a huge amount of experimental work. You see this in early age, making baskets with the assistance of <coughs> servants. He also uh, built an apparatus, and uh, Jemima painted these 10 frames of animation. Jemima painted the 10 frames of animation, and he built an apparatus to turn the crank, and this is what you see. If you want uh, the animated GIF that does this, go to our, so our, our website, again, sonicsoftware.com, and download it. Uh, at play, here is uh, Toby, uh, their dog, as described by uh, Lewis Campbell. This was a terrier of the mustard kind called Toby Tobbins, or Tobbit, according to the moment's humor. Maxwell is, uh, with the assistance of his father, Maxwell is uh, training Toby to do some tricks. Maxwell loved dogs. He always had a dog, and it was always, always named Toby. As an indication of some of the things Maxwell could do, um, uh, Campbell describes, one evening at Glenlair, just as the maidservant was coming in with a tea tray, Jamesy blew out the light in the narrow passageway and laid down across the dark doorway. Must have been quite a scene after that. I'm sure his mother was very patient. And for fun, as Campbell says, Maxwell liked to slide on the oar in times of frost, to leap ditches and climb pole, climb trees of sorts, and see them felled and have grand game at getting upon them while falling to take wasp nests and hot days in July and to blow soap bubbles and marvel at their changing hues. Foreshadowing passage here. Soap bubbles, changing hues. Why does a soap bubble have, have colors on it? Uh, we'll go back to 15 and 1600s. There's a huge argument going on back and forth between Newton, who said light is a particle, Huygens and Hook, who said light is a wave. Very vicious battle going back and forth. Well, Thomas Young, this is the same Young as the Young's modulus of elasticity. Thomas Young had proposed that if light is a wave, then the colors on a soap bubble are easily explained as an inter interference phenomenon of double reflection from two surfaces. If light's a particle, can't really explain the colors on a soap bubble. So one point for the theory that light is a wave. We'll return to this topic in a few moments as well. Uh, here we see uh, Maxwell is uh, building an uh, inverted pyramid with a friend, and here Maxwell is tubbing on the oar with Jemima. Here's the original watercolor by uh, Jemima. There's Jemima. We see the side of her face. She rarely painted her own face. And there's Maxwell. Try to read Maxwell's face there. What is he thinking? I, I think he's there thinking uh, he's pretending he's a great British sailing captain, perhaps Lord Nelson defending Britain from, in, from foreign invasion. Uh, and the pool we know today, this is, um, uh, we're pretty sure we know where the pool is. And uh, I tried to get, it's middle of July, I tried to get, I could only get up, up to by me, it's bitterly cold. My son Brian could get in all the way and go swimming with the owner's dog, and the owner's dog's name is, of course, Toby. And uh, Maxwell loved to swim. Maxwell undoubtedly swam here many times. He uh, described how he would swim in um, the, the uh, Cam, River Cam, Cambridge Cam, River Cam. Uh, and he would uh, get up on one bank of the cam and do a belly flopper and swim over to the other bank, get up, do a back flopper. And he said it stimulated the circulation. I'm sure it did. Uh, here we see young Maxwell. We know people are because Jemima Lalo. J.W. is Jemima Wedderburn. John Clark Maxwell is Maxwell's father. J.C.M. is our guy. And Mrs. Wedderburn is his aunt, his father's sister. 
And uh, here we see young Maxwell is enticing his aunt's mount with a bit of hay when his father's horse has gone into has gone into graze mode and stopped. And notice young Maxwell not looking where he's going. He's about to get a very sudden introduction to Newton's F equals M A courtesy of the rear end of a horse. <laughs> here he is uh, halfway between um, uh, between Glen Lair and uh, Edinburgh at Newton, staying with relatives. There's young Maxwell. There's Maxwell's father, and there's Jemima. Here they're thinking of his father, and Maxwell's father is thinking about increasing the size of the herd with young Maxwell and, uh, and Jemima. And here they are in a family play. There's young Maxwell climbing a pole. I'm guessing that uh, Maxwell wanted, was very, very, you know, wanted to do lots of things, so he said, your important role in this play is to go climb that pole and get out of our hair. He's also in this picture. See if you can guess where he is. Uh, let's see, Je Jemima, JW, Jemima's right there. That's Jemima. And look along here. There's JCM. Follow JCM down. There's Maxwell right there. He's dressed up in pretty, as a pretty little girl. Here they are uh, racing to get out of the sudden rain. Uh, it's often rainy and cool in Scotland. But uh, this is a plowing competition. There is uh, Maxwell, there's Jemima, and there's Maxwell's father. Uh, but this, this uh, Glen Lair was paradise for Maxwell, absolute heaven. He could do all kinds of things, explore and inquire about many different things, until an incredible tragedy strikes. At eight years old, Maxwell's mother dies. It was uh, stomach cancer. They operated shortly before her death in an unsuccessful attempt to save her. Uh, Maxwell's comment when told of his mother's death seems quite odd. Oh, I'm so glad. Now she'll have no more pain until you realize that while at this time general anesthetic had been discovered, it was not yet in use. The intensity of this experience of both mother and child, we cannot today even imagine it. Uh, Maxwell's mother was doing all his education, and in these, Maxwell's upper class. Upper class kids go to college, lower class kids do not. And he has to have a high school education. There is no local high school to go to. So they hire a tutor to replace his mother, and as described by Campbell, the episode of the tutor was not a happy one. I would omit the fact, as well as the name, were I not convinced that this first experience of harsh treatment had effects which long remained, not in any bitterness though, to be smitten on the head with a ruler and have one's ears pulled till they bled, might naturally have operated in that direction, but in a certain hesitation of manner, an obliquity of reply, which Maxwell was long in getting over, if indeed he ever got over them. <coughs> Key phrases here is hesitation of manner and obliquity of reply. Hesitation of manner. Maxwell had trouble talking. It wasn't stuttering. People described it as had too many ideas in his head all coming out at the same time. So he was a terrible lecturer. Obliquity of reply. Maxwell loved to use irony. Anything Maxwell has written through his entire career, you always have to read with an eye to, is he using irony? What I mean by irony is let's pretend it's terrible weather outside, and I come in and say, oh, fantastic, a beautiful day, huh? And I'm saying one thing, but I mean another. That's irony. And the problem with using irony is people might not understand it. Uh, oh, you think today is a beautiful day? You must be weird. Uh, Maxwell's use of irony would frequently go over people's heads, so you always have to be careful, be careful of that. Here he is escaping from the cruel tutor by means of a tub in the tub pond, and here is the duck pond has been restored. The ducks are now fake ducks. It used to be real ducks, but the animal rights activists released the mink on a neighboring farm. The mink came over from that farm to Glen Lair and ate Glen Lair's ducks. So now he has fake ducks. This is Captain Retired Duncan Ferguson of the British Navy, who has uh, restored the uh, duck pond and uh, is assisting in the restoration or preservation of Glen Lair. So Miss Jane Kay, his mother's cute little sister, discovers the mistreatment, and they decide to send Maxwell, young Maxwell, off to uh, live with his aunt in Edinburgh at 31 Harriet Row. Here is young Maxwell, and there's Maxwell's father. And, uh, Edinburgh, this is 31 Harriet Row, right here, opposite a beautiful private uh, garden area. Around the corner, remember 14 India Street, Maxwell's birthplace, around the corner, 14 India Street. And uh, 6 Great Stewart Street, that's where Miss Jane Kay lived. He would often uh, spend time, a lot of time at both aunts. The two aunts didn't care for each other very much, but they did care for their uh, young Maxwell, very supportive. Of Maxwell. And Edinburgh Academy is up here. You walk down a fairly steep hill uh, to get to Edinburgh Academy. There is 31 Harriet Row today. Uh, and 14 India Street is presently owned by the James Clark Maxwell Foundation. A word on that in just a moment. Uh, on the 
first floor, there is a beautiful uh, museum with many natural artifacts here. If you are ever in Edinburgh and you do much with electromagnetics, you must visit this site. It is not open on a regular basis. You have to call ahead. But it is well worth a visit. Plan at least a half a day, maybe a full day there. On the second floor, they have a meeting room for up to 30, 40 people. Uh, you can have a small conference there if you want. And this is 6th grade Stewart Street. You walk in the front door, go all the way back, turn to the right, and look right there is Maxwell doing homework. 6th grade Stewart Street today. Uh, for, at 14 India Street, the James Clark Maxwell Foundation was founded by retired RPI professor Sidney Ross. Uh, he founded it and has done some fantastic, incredible work, all because of this gentleman. We should be very, very proud of him. I visited him uh, earlier this afternoon. He's at uh, the terrace at Eddie Memorial. Had a little hard time getting around, but he's 100% there. He would be absolutely thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to have visits from any of you, any of you or all of you, uh, discussing Maxwell. He's had a lot to do with Maxwell. He would be very, you know, it's, you know just a few minutes walk from here. Uh, be sure to go visit uh, Professor Ross. He would, he would be very pleased. He's had a, he's uh, had a lot to do with Maxwell. It was a million dollars to acquire 14 in history, by the way. He, he arranged stuff. He was able to get that money. Um, okay, back to the main flow. Edinburgh Academy in 1828, um, before Maxwell was there. It looks much the same today. Then and today, it was a leading edge educational institution. But back then, it meant something different from what it means today. Back then, it meant that their boys, they boasted, and it was just boys at that time, just upper class boys, unlike today. Their boys could conjugate 800 irregular Greek verbs by the age of 12. Maxwell hated memorization. He called it mothery. First three of six years there was mostly memorization. He did not do very well. He, he actually got fairly poor grades. The second three years, of course, is required some understanding. So he started actually get, getting some medals and started doing fairly well in the second three years. Also, another thing here to keep in mind, um, uh, Back home in Glenlair, they speak with a very thick Corsac Scottish accent. As a native English speaker, I had to ask for occasional repeats. I couldn't understand it. The accent was so thick. The, English, uh, the Scottish accent in Edinburgh was much lighter. Very easy for a native English speaker to understand. So Maxwell uh, speaks with this uh, much different accent than uh, the Edinburgh boys. He's also a country boy. He has a, on a different kind of jacket. He has on square-toed shoes that his father made. Very practical, very good shoes. But all the other boys have these narrow-toed black shoes. Uh, and his, uh, you know, his talks funny. He has this, uh, he uses irony. So even when he talks, they can't, you can't. Sometimes you can't understand what he, what he means, even if you understood what he says. And uh, the. Uh, drop back to the mental, the psychology. We've all either experienced it or have been had interaction with it. Uh, the male uh, teen and preteen psychology uh, is very uh, strong towards uniformity. You don't want to be different from the group. Now, Maxwell is very different. His aunt makes a huge mistake, makes him even more different. She sets him off to school. Uh, the day she sets him off to school, so it shows this cute little frilly collar on his coat. And sends them off to school with all these city kids. And um, this is where Campbell meets Maxwell. As uh, Campbell describes it, what happened in the interval after the first lesson in the space behind the second classroom is best indicated in the words of the psalmist. They came about me like bees. Who made those shoes? was the first question, but it was never easy to get a direct answer from Maxwell, least of all upon compulsion. Brought thus to bay, he had recourse to his natural weapon, irony. His answer was soon ready, and his tormentors might make of it whatever they wish. In the broadest tones of his Corsac accent, he replied to one of them, Did he ken? Twas a man, and he lived in a house, in which was a mouse. He returned to Harriet Row that afternoon, his tunic and rags, and wanting the skirt, his neat frill, rumpled and torn, himself excessively amused by his experiences and not showing the smallest sign of irritation. First day of classes, Maxwell was beat up. As a, a, a special note of irony, Maxwell himself would appreciate it. If you turn 180 degrees from where I took this picture and look, you will see a brand new building, the James Clark Maxwell uh, Science Center. Uh, Maxwell was quite a poet. 
Uh, here we see him, uh, see a poet that he wrote. This is in the, uh, the Campbell biography, available on our website. The uh, Vampire, here the, this is written and illustrated in Maxwell's own hand. The gallant knight is lured by the sweet young damsel into a boat, into the middle of a lake, where the knight meets a very gruesome man. Read the poem if you'd like to see what, what happened. He was not a world-class poet, but uh, the poetry gives us a lot of insight into Maxwell. And also, a, a letter that Maxwell wrote at this time, you know, uh, think about the situation Maxwell's in. He has trouble making friends. He does make a couple friends. One is P.G. Tate, a straight-A valedictorian type. Very good friends all through lives with Maxwell, but P.G. Tate was not the genius. Maxwell frequently made mistakes even in his professional published work. Maxwell was the genius. Uh, but they were very, and, and they're very competitive. Sometimes Tate would win, sometimes Maxwell would, would win, but they're always, always good friends throughout their entire lives. And he also makes friends with Lewis Campbell. That's about it. Other than that, he doesn't make friends well. He is doing poor in classes. He's different. He talks funny. Face it, the kid's a loser. And then, in a letter to his father in 1844, before he's had any education in geometry, he writes, I have made a tetrahedron, a dohecahedron, and two other hedrons whose names I do not know. Two other hedrons whose names he does not know. Maybe we should keep an eye on this kid after all. The tormenting lasted all six years while he was at Edinburgh Academy, a little bit less on the, on the second three years when he started to perform well. But uh, he never talked much about it later, but he did at one point say, they never understood me but I understood them. Maxwell publishes his first paper at age 14. Now, when I was a kid, I stuck two pins in a paper, put a string around it, put a pencil in to draw a beautiful ellipse. You've probably done the same thing. I stopped there. You probably stopped there, too. Maxwell didn't stop there. He said, what if I put in three pins? And here we have it. Uh, first pin, you tie the string to the first pin. The string goes and slides around the pencil. No tie. Slides around the pencil. Slides around the next pin slides around the third pin, and then ties off to the pencil. Now when you move this, move the pencil, you get an oval curve. The distance from every point on that oval curve, the sum of the distance is two three foci is a constant. Put in four pins, have four foci. Put the string back and forth a couple times, and have twice the distance of one foci, plus the distance to a second foci being a constant. Whole family of oval curves, they write it up in the paper. He and his father take it to a family friend, Professor Forbes, remember this name, Professor Forbes, at the University of Edinburgh. Forbes takes it to his colleges, his colleagues, and they say, this has all been done before by Descartes and Newton. However, the unique way of drawing it is new and deserves publishing at the Royal Society. Improper for someone that's 14 year old to mount the podium at the Royal Society, so Professor Forbes actually presents the paper. Uh, a historian later commented, it is astounding to have uh, the discoveries of a 14-year-old described in the same sentence with Descartes and Newton. Polarized light. I passed this around a little earlier. If you didn't see it, come, come down afterwards. Uh, uh, Campbell was there when this happened. Very important event in Maxwell's life. In the spring of 1847, his uncle, Mr. John Kay, took James and myself to see Mr. Nicole, a friend of Sir David Brewster. This is the Brewster of the Brewster angle and the inventor of the polarizing prism. The polarizing prism is made out of ice and spar. You put ice and spar over a line and you see double. And remember Thomas Young? Well, if uh, light is a wave, and you can see two waves, what that means is it has to be transverse, because if it's a longitudinal wave, you only have one, you don't have polarization. It's just longitudinal, that's it. If it's transverse, you can have horizontal or vertical polarization. So if light is a wave, it has to be transverse because we see two of them there. There's two waves. So light must be, a, if it's a wave, it must be a transverse wave. Gotcha. Light is a vibration. It has to vibrate in a medium. Remember, this is 19th century. The medium, we'll call it this luminiferous ether. Can't feel it, touch it, or, or sense it or anything like that but it can't have any shear strength because the earth is plowing through it and it doesn't spiral into the sun. Go poof. So the luminiferous ether can't have any shear strength. Gotcha. You can't have a transverse wave in a medium that has no shear strength. So light can't be a wave, it must be a particle. One point for light being a particle. Today that controversy is like a wave or a particle is firmly settled in favor of, yes, it is a particle wave. Uh, Maxwell, uh, Nicole was so impressed 
with Maxwell's work. He gave him two of these uh, polarizing prisms. Two was important. Maxwell ran home, actually, to Miss Cage home. I don't think Ms. What Mrs. Wedderburn would have appreciated this. And he ground up a bunch of glass, poured it into molds, and then cooled it very different shapes. Cooled it very quickly so the glass is stressed. It's unannealed glass. And then he put down one polarizing prism, polarized light, put down the glass, put down a second polarizing prism, they call it the analyzer, build a camera with seated to project pretty colors on the kitchen table, which he painted in his own hand in watercolor right there. Now, Professor Stokes, amazing time in Scottish history. So many people, famous people in one place at the same time. Professor Stokes is a family friend. He solved Stokes equations for the stresses and strains in glass and publishes measured versus calculated. These are the bits of glass, the actual bits of glass that Maxwell molded and studied on today at the Cavendish Laboratory. He uh, finishes Edinburgh Academy and goes to University of Edinburgh. It's a uh, kind of wasted time. He's not very highly challenged there. Starts working a little bit with color perception and has a good time, but uh, he's not particularly challenged until he goes to Cambridge. It's a little bit difficult for him to go to, or for his father actually, to allow him to go to Cambridge uh, because it's an English university and he's Scottish and he has certain, certain conceptions about what those English people are like. But uh, he does go because Cambridge is the number one university in the world for mathematics. And Maxwell wants to study mathematics and natural philosophy as they called it then. Today we call it physics. Uh, age 19 through 24, Cambridge on the River Cam. Uh, he starts out at Peterhouse College, mostly mathematicians for unknown reasons. They expect their story to speculate uh, in order to get a greater variety of people to interact with and a better chance of scholarship. He switches to Trinity College. Trinity College is where Newton was a student and professor. Cambridge is a loose collection of colleges. They each have their own uh, uh, tutors, their own cafeterias, their own uh, 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 scholarships. Uh, loosely collected into a university. The thing you do when you go to Cambridge is you study to uh, take the Tripos exam and uh, rock star status if you win. If you're, no, if you're number one, your first regular. E.G. Tate, remember Maxwell's friend at Edinburgh Academy? Previous year was number one, first regular. High expectations for Maxwell. However, uh, uh, several months before Maxwell took the exam, uh, he was visiting some friends, and he writes to Campbell, I intended to return on the 18th of June, but on the 17th I felt unwell and took measures accordingly to be well again, i.e. went to bed, made up my mind to recover. But it lasted more than a fortnight, during which time I was taken care of beyond expectation. When I was perfectly useless and could not sit up without fainting, they did everything for me in such a way I had no fear of getting trouble. They kept me in great happiness and detained me until I could walk about and got to strength and could return on the 4th of July. He took the exam in January, it's uh, an unheated room. People said as he was leaving, he was actually staggering. It's a very intense uh, exam. He came in second. First place was a fellow by the name of Ralph. Uh, he a little later took the Smith's Prize, uh, first, he was tied for first, first place in Smith's Prize. The person he tied with was Ralph. This is Ralph of the Ralph Stability Criterion. Maxwell actually had quite a bit to do with uh, uh, a foundation of, of a control theory uh, field. Uh, here's a picture of Maxwell in, uh, well, is it Cambridge? Look at the eyes. The eyes. The, 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 same, the same as the uh, infant sketch. We got the fire in the eyes of Maxwell. Uh, digress for just a moment. During a summer vacation while he was at Cambridge, uh, he uh, spent, some, uh, spent a summer in the lake region of Scotland uh, with uh, uh, his mother's family, the Kay family, and he had a hot summer romance with Lizzie Kay, first cousin. A little tight loop on the family tree here, but Queen Victoria is married to her first cousin, Prince Albert. So it does happen. She's 14, he's 23. A little bit of an age difference there. At this time, age 15, is uh, you're considered eligible for, well, young ladies are considered eligible for marriage. So, uh, But uh, for, unknown, for unknown reasons, probably due to the age difference in the tight loop on the family tree, at the end of the summer they break off the romance. I mention that because it plays a role later in life. While at uh, Cambridge, Maxwell uh, starts playing with his colored top, or in this case, we see illustrated the colored disc. And uh, remember Thomas Young with the colors on the soap bubble? The same Thomas Young proposed a tricolor theory of light. How many primary colors of light are there? He said, well, maybe there's three. He turned out to be right. What are they? He took a guess. They weren't quite right. So uh, Maxwell actually does an experiment here. 
And in this experiment, you've got on the inside this maybe 20% white and 80% black. On the outside, you have X percent something, Y percent something else. You spin it really fast and adjust the percentages until you get the same color inside and outside. Uh, then you've got an equation. 20% white plus 80% black equals dot, 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 dot. Do up a whole bunch of equations, find an orthogonal basis that spans the space. The orthogonal basis is red, green, and blue. Remember the tile floor? Red, green, and blue. Your monitors, RGB monitors. Artists will say the co primary colors are different. That's because they work with reflected light. Transmitted light, red, green, and blue are the primary colors. Maxwell uh, uh, experimentally determined that. It also starts working with, men, with Faraday's lines of force. Faraday is a whole nother incredible story. Uh, he grew up as a, the lower middle class. He was the son of a blacksmith. Uh, his father died when he was eight years old. He was apprenticed to a bookbinder. He started reading the books he was binding. And one of them was Encyclopedia Britannica. He read an article about electricity. He said, this is fantastic. I've got to become a scientist. One problem, he's middle class. You aren't allowed to go to university. How Faraday became one of Britain's greatest scientists ever is a whole other story for another day. Uh, what I will comment is that in 1831, Maxwell was literally a babe in arms. Faraday starts investigating electromagnetism with this electromagnetic, electromag, illustrated on the map, on, on the stand. And uh, Orsted, a few years earlier, figured out you've got electric current carrying wire. You bring a compass close to it, it affects the compass. So the electric current, whatever this fluid is that electric current is, you bring a compass close to it, the electric current makes uh, a magnetism. No, I didn't say magnetic field. Magnetic concept of magnetic field does not yet exist. Uh, well, nature likes symmetry, so it should work in the reverse direction. We should be able to take magnetism and make an electric current. Lots of couple we'll call it magnetic induction. You even got a name for it. Lots of people tried to find it. Unsuccessful. Faraday tried to find it. Unsuccessful. He tried and tried. It didn't work. Okay, deal with it. End of experiment. Open the switch. Wait a minute. The needle quivered for just a second. It went still. Okay. Close the switch. Needle quivers for just a second. It goes still. Aha! It's changing electricity that makes magnetism dB by dT term in Maxwell's equations. Faraday discovers this when Maxwell is a babe in arms. At this time, action at distance is the primary uh, electromagnetic uh, model. Uh, Newton is lord and ruler over all physics. If you don't go back to Newton, is you know why, you, you bother me, kid, get away from here. And Newton approves of action at a distance uh, with gravitating bodies. <coughs> he was never ever satisfied with the fact there's no mechanical connection between gravitating bodies. But, he said, well, we'll just have to deal with that, figure it out later. Uh, action at a distance, though, okay, does, action at a distance doesn't really work if we have time varying things. But we'll figure something out. You know, it, it, it violates conservation of energy, so we'll figure something out. Faraday, why are you messing with this? Uh, with lines of force. What well, Faraday called it is the magnets have a, a, a mysterious electrotonic state around them. And there's changes in this electrotonic state that cause the electromagnetic actions. Um, uh, electrotonic state we have today, but it's not magnetic field. We'll solve that mystery in a few minutes as well. Maxwell was extremely religious, very devout. And I'll write in, in a letter that Maxwell wrote to Campbell. Campbell is a minister, as well as being a close friend. He says, now my great plan is a plan of search and recovery. The rule of the plan is to let nothing be willfully left unexamined. Nothing is to be holy ground consecrated to stationary title, whether positive or negative. I assert the right of trespass on any plot of holy ground which any man has set apart to the power of darkness. Um, what he's saying is if you have a hypothesis that can be tested, that is a matter for science. Is the earth the center of the universe? Or is the sun the center of the universe? Both hypotheses are false, but hope, hope both hypotheses are testable, thus a matter for science. They are not a matter for religion. If you have a hypothesis that is not testable, that is a matter of faith, and that is a matter for religion. It is not a matter for science. And thus, uh, one of the most uh, famous physicists of all time could also be an extremely devout, very religious person, because the two uh, would, were, were exist in the same uh, worldview without conflict. Uh, in the closing of that letter, Maxwell does make a statement, though, that is, Please don't judge it by modern standards. I give it here only to give some insight into Maxwell and the, and the Victorian era. He says, 
Now I am convinced that no one but a Christian can actually purge his land of these holy spots. I think today we would be more likely to say that anyone of any religion can purge their, purge their land of these holy spots. Uh, Maxwell was a, a, a father was Presbyterian, mother Episcopalian. His religion was kind of a mixture of the two with uh, some local Galloway customs thrown in. Uh, he was very close to his father. Uh, his father uh, passed away shortly after he had applied for a position at Marshall College in Aberdeen. He would have been very, his father would have been very pleased to know that uh, uh, Max's son had become a professor at um, uh, Robin at Scottish University. Such was not to be the case, as uh, Maxwell writes in the letter to Miss Jane Kay. My father died today at 12 o'clock. He was sleepless and confused at night, but got up to breakfast. He saw the gardener a few minutes and spoke rationally, then came into the drawing room and sat down on a chair for a few minutes to rest, gave a short cry, and never spoke again. We gave him ether for a little, but he could not swallow it. There was no warning and apparently no pain. Maxwell was extremely close to his father, as we'll see in the next slide. But uh, in, well, in Aberdeen, he wrote a letter to Lewis Campbell. He wrote, uh, society is pretty steady in this latitude, plenty of diversity, but little of great merit or demerit, honest on the whole and not vulgar. No jokes of any kind are understood here, and I have not made one for two months, and if I feel one coming, I shall bite my tongue. His use of irony was not appreciated in Aberdeen. Uh, this is a, uh, the last Jemima watercolor that I'll show you. It's the only one that has a painting of Maxwell as an adult. The only Jemima watercolor with Maxwell having a beard. See if you can see him in there. Uh, Jemima, uh, Jemima is right in the center there with a blue dress. She loved that blue. Maxwell is inside this square. We'll blow it up a little bit. Do you see him? <coughs> right there. Right there is Maxwell with a beard as an adult. Uh, read Maxwell's expression. Now, you can read any one of those expressions. They're all undoubtedly completely accurate. Read Maxwell's expression. What I see is he's sitting there thinking, gee, Dad should be here. This was a big event. You could only get to it by ship. Your mind is a state. You could only get to it by ship. And uh, so it's a big family event. And gee, Dad should be here. He is very close to his father. At Everdeen, he gets married. Catherine Mary Dewar. I don't know if it's any relation to Dewar or Flask. Uh, daughter of the principal. Looks like a really cool political move because in those days the principal is absolute ruler over the entire the entire university. Uh, but Maxwell was not political. And uh, let's let's there are no children. Let's see if we can uh, read her expression. I don't know what to make of this. I feel a little uneasy, but I don't know what to make of it. Let's look at Maxwell. He's looking down at his wife with devotion. Campbell describes. Uh, extreme devotion, very, very good husband on the part of Maxwell. He strangely doesn't describe anything at all about Catherine. Not a word. The biography was printed when Catherine was still alive. By the way. There's something more in Maxwell's expression though as well. Uh, it's, it's a sadness. Maybe it's sadness from his father's death. Maybe that's still bothering him. Let's fast forward through 11 years of marriage. Here's a photograph, not a painting. This is a photograph. Look at Maxwell. Well, actually, let's start with a dog. Uh, it doesn't look like a Scottish Terrier. I think it's a fake dog sitting here. Maybe it's live. Maybe it's real. I don't know. Uh, fake background. Look at um, look at uh, Catherine's face. Uh, you know, ignore the hairstyle. Ignore the dress. Just look at the face. Read the expression here. What I read is someone who is trying very, very hard to look pleasant but not succeed. In fact, uh, Catherine was extremely abrasive. Alienated all of Maxwell's friends. Uh, as described, remember uh, Jemima, the lady that you can't, uh, you aren't going to bluff? She wrote in her memoirs, which were published after Catherine's death, she wrote, uh, James became a professor at Aberdeen and married a daughter of the principal there. This did not give much satisfaction to his friends. The lady was neither pretty nor healthy nor agreeable, but much enamored of him. It was said, uh, well, let's listen carefully here, it was said that her sister had brought about the match by telling him how much she was in love with him, and he, being a very affectionate and tender disposition, married her out of gratitude. Her mind afterwards became unsettled, but she, she was neurotic in her old age, but he was always most kind to her and put up with it all. She alienated him from his friends and was of a suspicious and jealous nature. I do not think I ever saw him angry or heard him say a word against anyone. Remember Lizzie Kay, that's Hot Summer Romance? She knew about that, that hot summer romance with Lizzie Kay. Maxwell, prior to the announcement, if you read the, his uh, letter to Miss Kay announcing the engagement, it's really kind of bizarre. It's almost like he's apologizing to Miss Kay. 
And in fact, following the engagement, prior to the engagement, there were lots of written communication with the female side of the K family, his mother's family. After the engagement, nothing. He still has interaction with them, but there's no written communication from that point on. Uh, saddest thing in this picture, look at Maxwell's face. Look at the eyes. The fire is gone. He is still very, very productive scientifically. And in fact, Catherine helps him with experiments, sometimes quite physically strenuous. Uh, she's very supportive of her husband, but um, uh, the fire is gone. Uh, while in Aberdeen, Maxwell starts working on Saturn's rings. Our, uh, the Adams Prize, Adams and Le Verrier, uh, Frenchman and Englishman, huge battle there, who discovered Neptune. Adams rises above the fray, establishes Adams Prize <coughs> in mathematical problem in astronomy. This year, it is what are Saturn's rings? Are they uh, solid? Well, you require, if Maxwell figures out mathematically, you require such a bizarre mass distribution to equalize the tidal forces that it, it could, not be, uh, could not be solid. Are they liquid? A small perturbation would grow without limit, unstable. Control theory, stability, okay, grow without limit. So it couldn't be liquid. So they have to be lots of little particles. Maxwell writes his equation, in this case, for a, a model that he had built in Aberdeen, um, uh, or a ring of moons with a, uh, a traveling wave on it. Uh, you turn the crank and the moons move. Do you remember the Voyager pictures, the braided rings? You put two of these together, you have braided rings. Pretty cool. And he just did this with pencil and paper, figured out with pencil and paper. Um, uh, my personal speculation, most everything that I tell you is stuff that uh, historians, I've read historians, I try not to insert my own conclusions in. One, one of my own uh, observations, though, completely unsubstantiated but uh, intriguing, that looks like a Bohr atom, doesn't it? Uh, you know, a certain number of sine waves around in an orbit. I wonder if Bohr saw this and maybe he was inspired. Pure speculation, personal speculation. Uh, this is a many-body problem, paved the way for the theory of gases, lots of little balls bouncing around. Uh, trouble on the horizon is uh, two colleges in Aberdeen, King's College of Aberdeen, there are many college, King's Colleges around, this one in Aberdeen, and Marshall College are going to be fused. They, uh, there's two professors for every position, they're quite explicit on who they're going to keep. They're going to keep the younger professor in order to minimize pension costs. Today, if you do that, you have to do it secretly. Back then, they just say that's what they're doing, and they do it. Maxwell is the younger of the two professors. He's married to the daughter of the principal. He's got a name, right? Well, his nickname, I, I forgot to mention, the nickname back in Edinburgh, as people couldn't understand it, was Daffy. His nick, uh, the nickname of his competitor is Crafty. Crafty gets the position. We don't know why. It had nothing to do with the fact that Maxwell apparently never attended a faculty meeting. He uh, only spent six months of the year on campus. He couldn't lecture. Also had nothing to do with the fact he is now with his Saturn's rings. He has established world-class reputation in mathematics. Nothing to do with those factors. Crafty gets his position. Uh, Professor Forbes, family friend back at the University of Edinburgh, is retiring. Uh, turns out his classmate, P.G. Tate, a straight A valedictorian guy, gets the position. Because Tate can lecture, Maxwell cannot. Maxwell finally gets a position at King's College. He's successful. This is King's College in London, now. different King's College. Um, uh, next to Kensington Gardens is where Maxwell lived, and King's College is <coughs> over here, uh, next to the river. Uh, Maxwell was riding in the, he loved to ride, and he was riding with his wife in Kensington Gardens one day, and under a low hanging branch got scratched in his head. He became infected, bacterial infection, often fatal. His wife nursed him back to health. He credits his wife with saving his life. Prior to this, in between jobs, back at Glen Lair, he came down with smallpox, often fatal, uh, very contagious, his wife knows this. His wife nurses him back to health, so maybe she alienated all his friends, but she did take care of her man, which is crucially important here because Maxwell has not yet published Maxwell's equations in their final form. There's still work to be done there. Uh, King's College today. Uh, remember red, green, and blue? Well, at King's College, Maxwell has the bright idea. Why don't I take three photographs through red, green, and blue filters? And then I'll have three projectors. Project them all. And these are the original negatives. Uh, on display at 14 India Street. And there's the pho color photograph, first color photograph, Maxwell made first color photograph, projected today almost exactly the same way it was projected by Maxwell at the meeting of the Royal Society with three projectors all except our three projectors are all in one box. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, historical um, uh, 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 note here. Uh, it turns out that the um, coll colloidal process used back then for the negatives was totally, completely insensitive to red. There's plenty of red in the picture. Where did this red come from? It turns out that the filter used is transparent to ultraviolet, and the, the negatives are very sensitive to ultraviolet. So it's really ultraviolet, green, and uh, uh, blue. But Maxwell still gets credit for the first color photograph. 
Uh, Maxwell, by this time in 1862, has figured out the displacement current, put it into what uh, will one day, not yet, one day be called Maxwell's equations, and figures out that uh, if you calculate the speed of light based on the electrostatic and magnetostatic, he doesn't have epsilon and mu yet. Those are not terminology used. Magnetostatic and electrostatic quantities, uh, you can figure out the speed of light based on static measurements. And here's a mechanical measurement uh, of light. Uh, mirrors on the, on the edge of a spinning wheel actually measure it. And so, so close together, it concludes that light must be an electromagnetic wave. Uh, modern value, of course, is a, a, a bit different. That's not uncommon in physics, by the way. But today, it's an it's a exact defined constant. It will never be measured any more accurately than this. Uh, in 1862, Maxwell is still trying to develop a mechanical model for the ether, which I'll show you in a moment, which is difficult because it's a uh, the shearless medium that must tra the transmit the transverse wave. How do you do that? How do you do a mechanical model that just does that? Okay, he goes into uh, retirement, writes the treatise on electricity and magnetism at Glenlair, founding document for our uh, field. He is then offered a chair at Cambridge to found Cavendish Laboratory. Duke of Devonshire, his ancestor is Henry Cavendish, uh, funds the laboratory. Maxwell accepts the position. He was the third one offered it, and he accepted the position. Uh, during this time, he writes a number of articles in Encyclopedia Britannica, one on the atom, and here is the article. Fascinating reading. I'll read a little bit of it for you. For example, the atom is not proven to exist until Einstein's work with Brownian motion in 1905. Though it's been speculated since 300 BC, but uh, it's not proven to exist until then. So he still is still speculative. So he writes here, uh, into the first paragraph, um, the. Um, the doctrine of infinite divisibility of bodies that is in direct contradiction with the theory of atoms. He has to give some lip service to that. Uh, something really strange happens here, too. It has to do with rarefied gases. Uh, uh, by this time, Maxwell has figured out that you have something called radiation pressure. So you should be able to test it. This is science, right? You have a hypothesis, you test it. Um, so, okay, we'll test it. We'll take a glass sphere, take all the air out, put this little windmill inside. The flags will have white on one side, black on the other. The light will strike the white side, mounts off, strike the black side and be absorbed. So it'll go around and around, white pushing, black leaning. Go around and around. Okay, let's build it. They build it, put it out in the sun. Hey, it spins. Wait a minute. It's spinning a lot faster than we predicted. Hold on, it's going in the wrong direction. Black pushing, white leaning. So a fellow by the name of Reynolds hypothesizes that what's happening is the black side is hotter. We've got a rarefied gas in here, not vacuum. And the gas is boiling off the black side, providing some thrust. Not quite what's happening, but close enough. Uh, so it goes around and around, black leading, white, white, uh, black pushing, white leading. And um, uh, writes a paper. Maxwell is the reviewer. Maxwell writes a scathing review, points out a number of mistakes, sends the paper back to Reynolds. Reynolds and then Maxwell takes Reynolds' work, uh, corrects it, adds some stuff to it, and publishes it with attribution to Reynolds' work. Said Reynolds did this and this. Not enough for Reynolds. Li Reynolds is livid. Huge argument going back and forth until finally a longtime Maxwell friend, Lord Kelvin, William Thompson, steps in to mediate. He says, Reynolds, uh, Maxwell is terminally ill. Maybe you ought to back off. Reynolds does back off. Uh, there is Cavendish Laboratory, the old Cavendish Laboratory as it stands today. They moved to new quarters outside of uh, Cambridge. Uh, his, uh, he faded for several years. Uh, when he passed away, his longtime friend Colin McKenzie, his wife, and Dr. Paget were present. As McKenzie reports, a few minutes before his death, Professor Clark Maxwell was being held up in bed, struggling for breath, when he said slowly and distinctly, God help me, God help my wife. Then he turned to me and said, Colin, you're strong, lift me up. He next said, Lay me down lower, for I'm very low myself, and it suits me to lie low. After this, he breathed deeply and slowly, and with a long look at his wife, passed away. James Clark Maxwell was dead at the age of 48, the same age his mother died, precisely 40 years earlier, of the same disease, stomach cancer, probably genetic in nature. Uh, to this tombstone is in the ruins of a small church, or kirk as the Scottish call it, uh, in the side yard of a much larger church that his father built and uh, is actually for sale today if you want to buy it. And uh, a very emotional site to visit after being involved with Maxwell's equations for 25 years. He, he, his wife, his mother, and his father are buried here. Uh, we teach our students that Maxwell saw the lack of symmetry in the four equations 
and added the DE by DT term, the displacement current, and now pops the speed of light. He did indeed add the DE by DT term, but the rest of the story is undoubtedly false. Uh, he did not have the four simple equations. Remember, he didn't have div and curl to work with on a formal basis. He had 20 equations in 20 variables, 20 simultaneous differential equations in 20 variables, and uh, he had uh, what he called uh, electromagnetic momentum as primary. We call it magnetic vector potential today, symbol A. You take the time derivative and you get force, same thing as mechanical momentum. He called it electromagnetic momentum. Um, so uh, the people that put uh, uh, the uh, uh, Maxwell's equations in their modern form, uh, one is Oliver Heaviside. Uh, read that face. What kind of person was Heaviside? He was really cranky, very outspoken, very much kept to himself, permanent life. Uh, he grew up in extreme poverty, uh, uh, Dixonian poverty in London. How he was, never went to university. He's totally self-educated in mathematics. Mathematical genius, uh, incredible story, Oliver Heaviside. He, as he, when he got hold of um, a treatise, Oliver Heaviside said, I browsed through it and I was astonished. I read the preface, the last chapter, and several bits here and there. I saw it was great, greater and greatest. I was determined to master the book and set to work. He also said, I never made any progress until I abandoned the vector potentials and all their parasites. Very outspoken person, uh, especially with people that were stupid. There were a few stupid people around, and he let them know they were stupid, and some of them were in political power, so he had... Yeah, he, he, was, uh, he was on the outs with him on a number of occasions. Uh, but he put Maxwell's equations into their modern form that you recognize today. Also added magnetic current and then electric vector potential. Hertz did the same thing, only using a different technique. He took this action at a distance, added local area corrections, and came up with a modern form of Maxwell's equations. Heaviside, Hertz, um, Lodge, and Fitzgerald. Only four people for 20 years, from 1865 to 1888, that uh, believed Maxwell's equations were correct. Lord Kelvin himself said Maxwell's equations were, were, were couldn't be correct. Even after Hertz's val uh, experimental validation, Hertz experimental, uh, experimentally validated Maxwell's equations then, uh, in 1888. Uh, the, why is magnetic field used a symbol B and magnetic vector potential has a symbol A? I asked the question to a lot of people, got lots of answers, but I don't think I had the right answer until I saw this table in the treatise. Uh, electromagnetic momentum, that's magnetic vector potential, is primary, so it's a symbol A. That's a view returning to uh, returning in physics, by the way, that magnetic vector potential is primary. Magnetic induction is B. It's derived from A, so it's secondary. That's why magnetic field is B, because it's second. Uh, this is uh, the diagram of the luminous ether. He published in 1862. It's gears and idle gears. Kind of looks like atoms. Nice description of displacement current and various other things. But uh, he gave up in 1865, just totally gave up on a mechanical description of luminiferous ether. 1865 paper, he just published the equations, 20 equations, and said, here they are, take them or leave them, no link to Newton and F equals MA. And that's why it took 20 years for them to be adopted. One reason is, you know, oh, nothing to F equals MA, get away from me, kid, you bother me. Can't take it serious. Um, and uh, sometimes we, we've become so familiar with electric and magnetic, uh, electric and magnetic fields, we start to think that they're real. Got news for you. They're not. They are mathematical abstractions beyond human perception. And that is not my conclusion. If you want to read about it, an essay by Freeman Dyson is available on our website. Read Freeman Dyson is one of the other uh, founders of quantum electrodynamics, and uh, he should have gotten a Nobel Prize too. But uh, you've got uh, pushing and pulling, which are real. Uh, you know, if baseball hits me, I can feel the jewels. Uh, uh, energy density. And what are the units of energy density? Joules per cubic meter. You want to measure the joules? No problem. Get a calorimeter. Want to measure a cubic meter? Give me a stick. I'll measure the cubic meter. I can perceive those things directly. Now, what are the units of electric and magnetic field? Uh, e squared is energy density. So square root of E squared is square root of joules divided by square root of cubic meters. How do you measure the square root of joules directly? How do you measure the square root of a cubic meter? These things are beyond human perception. What we do is uh, the E squareds, the H squareds, the E cross H's we can deal with. In Maxwell's equations, the brilliance in Maxwell's equations, we dive down in this completely abstract area of electric and magnetic fields, no connection with uh, direct perception, perception of reality. 
we do our calculations. I've been doing it for 25 years. It works really well. And then we come back up into the E squares, A squares, and E cross stages. Same thing in quantum electrodynamics. The um, Schrodinger wave function, it's the uh, square root of a complex square root of a probability. You can't perceive that. You can perceive the magnitude squared, which is a probability, but not the wave function directly. And basically, uh, uh, I remember asking as a, as a youngster, asking my teacher, why does a magnet attract a piece of iron? And, you know, it's really cool. You can't see anything, but you feel the force, strong force. Um, teacher said, oh, because of the magnetic field. Here, I'll even show you with iron filings. But, but, why does a magnet attract a piece of iron? Magnetic field is just another name for the problem. We can calculate it to the nth degree, but understanding why, we do not understand why. And that may actually be beyond human perception. Um, in conclusion, I'll read from that same Freeman Dyson essay. The ultimate importance of the Maxwell theory is far greater than its immediate achievement in explaining and unifying the phenomena of electricity and magnetism. Its ultimate importance is to be the prototype for all the great triumphs of 20th century physics. It is a prototype for Einstein's theories of relativity, for quantum mechanics, and for the unified theory of fields and particles known as the standard model. All of these theories are based on the concept of dynamical fields introduced by Maxwell in 1865. And thus it is, Maxwell freed us, all of us, from the confining womb of Newtonian mechanics and F equals MA, setting the stage for all, every single one, of the amazing developments of 20th century physics. Thank you for your kind attention.